Hi, this is Geshe Michael Roach with our next installment of learning to be a Tibetan language translator, uh, which is a very important skill because of the almost 200,000 classics in Tibetan language which are not available in the other countries yet. Uh, so today, uh, having gone through the basic alphabet, having learned to write all the letters, uh, having learned how words are formed through main letters, prefix letters, suffix letters, and secondary suffix letters, uh, we're ready to go on to Tibetan grammar, uh, you know, how, how sentences, we start into syntax, how our sentences put together. And I thought to train you uh, the same way that my teacher trained me, uh, he actually, uh, my teacher, Ken Rinpoche Geshe Losan Tachin, uh, who was one of the greatest scholars of the 20th century in Tibet, uh, he required me to memorize uh, a brief text on uh, grammar, on Tibetan grammar, in order to teach me grammar. So I thought I would go through the same text with you, and then if you are really feeling ambitious, you could also memorize this text. It's not bad. Uh, most Tibetan monks, when they're about, I don't know, 10 years old will we'll memorize this very short piece, which is only a few pages. So uh, I thought uh, we would go through that text, and, and we'll, this will take a few classes. Okay? Uh, so first I thought we could learn the title of the text, uh, which I've written here. I've written it all down ahead of time in order to save time on the video. And this is the full title of the very brief uh, text on Tibetan grammar that we'll be studying. Grammar is totally essential if you're going to learn to uh, translate Tibetan. Uh, you have to go at this through a classical method, I think. Uh, I don't think you can just pick it up on your own or pick it up uh, without formal training. If you have formal training in grammar, uh, you can be an awesome translator. And it's, So I think it's an important background. It's an old-fashioned way to learn a language. I think it's better. I think it's, it's going to teach you more. Sorry, today I have allergies. We are out in our new place in Sedona, which I'll show you a photo of here, uh, in the, in the, under the beautiful red rocks of our new college uh, in Sedona, Arizona, where we hope many of you can eventually come and learn to translate with us in the smaller specialized classes here. Uh, so here's the title of the Tibetan text that we're going to be studying for our basic grammar studies. Uh, I thought we could use the opportunity to Jorlog to practice the principles we've learned so far together as we go through this short uh, text, which is versed, it's in poetry. So it's easy to, it makes it easier to memorize. So let's, let's do some Jorloking. I won't overdo it, okay? Uh, we're gonna, Jorlok means to spell out loud, like C-A-T, cat, right? So let's do it. Uh, say sa, sa. shabku, su, su, ma, ma. Sum. sum. So we, it's uh, cumulative. We say uh, sa, shabku, and then how much we have so far is su, and then we say sum, ma, sum, okay? And then we have say cha, cha. shabku, chu. chu. Okay, remember this is first column and not second column, so it's high tone. And not so much aspiration. Sum chu. Say sum chu. Sum chu. Okay. Uh, sum means uh, the letter, the number three. Like chikni sum is one, two, three in Tibetan. But this is spelled differently. It's, it's uh, traditional to spell it differently in this particular combination. Uh, so three plus chu, which is also traditionally spelled differently, but in this combination spelled this way. So sum chu means the 30. Okay. And this is one of the this is a name of a famous book, and, and you should know about this book. Mm. Sum Chu Pa, which is what we have up to here, means the 30. And this was a book uh, written by uh, Tumi Sambota. Say Tunmi. Tunmi. Sambota. Sambota uh, probably means the Tibetan. Uh, Tumi, I don't know exactly what Tumi means. And I, I haven't studied his uh, biography. But in the 600s, uh, the Tibetan people had no written language, uh, they had no grammar, they had no books, but they wanted to learn Buddhism. So the king of Tibet organized a party of young Tibetan men to go to India and bring back an alphabet and grammar. And then, I, I, I don't remember how many, it was like 15 something like 15 young men were sent to India, and only a few survived the trip. 
in the in the seventh century, and the, one of the ones who came back was named Tumisambhota. So we know him as Tumisambhota. He brought back to Tibet an alphabet uh, based on the uh, on the Sanskrit alphabet of the time in India, and he brought back eight great books on grammar. Uh, as he aged after his return to Tibet, he composed eight different uh, denja or shastras on. Uh, on Tibetan grammar, okay? Six of those were lost historically. We've no, we don't know where they are. For many hundreds of years they've been lost. Only two books survive. One is called Sumchupa, which means the 30, and the other is called uh, Taki Jupa. Say Taki Jupa. So Sumchupa means the 30. Uh, I don't frankly recall whether it's a reference to the 30 consonants in the Tibetan alphabet or whether the book was written in 30 verses. I can check and let you know, okay? But he wrote the 30, and he wrote Tangi Jukpa, which means uh, how, to apply, um, how to apply suffix, how to apply particles to the words ending in certain suffixes. Jukpa means how to join. Tak means the sign, or, or the, uh, like Takma Druk means uh, I disagree with your reason. It means a sign. So it was a book about how to combine uh, suffix uh, particles according to suffixes in Tibetan. Only these two grammatical treatises remain of the eight that he wrote. So they are so famous that the first letter of each title, first word, syllable of each title was taken off, sum from sum chupa and tak from taki chupa, and they were joined into a new word called sum tak. Uh, which is a piece of each of the two titles of the books that survive. And Sumtak became the Tibetan word for grammar, the study of grammar. So it's a funny name. It means like the three endings or something. Thirty endings. But it's really just pieces from two separate titles. So Sumchupa is one of his famous uh, grammar books which survives. Uh, now let's go, uh, let's, let's do this one together. Ba. A, a, giku, i, i, pe, pe, okay, pe, pe. sum chu pe. pe. Of the of the thirty, okay, of the book named the thirty, sum chu pe, ta, ta naro, naro, to, to na, na, ten, 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 voiced, okay, ta, ta, na da, okay. This is not an English sound. There is no equivalent English sound. Dun would mean something else. Dun would mean to take out something from a box or something like that. This is dun, dun. Dun in, in Sanskrit is artha, like siddhartha. So it means meaning. It's the word meaning, okay, or goal. So, sumchipe dun means what? The meaning of the book called the 30, okay? Sumchipe dun. Uh, now let's, let's read this syllable. It's obviously got a prefix on it, so we're going to have to, if we're reading out loud, we add the, the syllable O. Kao. 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 It's not a G, okay? It's, it's voiced. Ka. 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 Kao. Sa. High tone S sibilant. Sa. La. Sel. Okay? Sel means to make clear. You know the word Ussel. The clear light. Okay, which is a which is a name of some great lamas. Okay, so sel, and then let's read this one together. Pa, pa yatak, yatak, cha, cha dengbu, dengbu, che, che ta. ta. This dot drops out, and the sound gets shortened, right, as a suffix letter. Che, che, che. 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 Okay, say sel che, sel che. Okay, so che is one of the most common verbs in any language which means to do, chepa, okay? So, sel, j, the j as a second syllable in Tibetan is often like an er in, in English, like plumber or teacher, okay? So, sel, j is what? Clear, clarifier, okay? A clarification, okay? A clarifier, a sel, j. Here he's making a pun. Why? The word in Tibetan for consonant is sel, j. The clarifier. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the most common grammatical terms in Tibetan. So he's making a pun. He's, 
He's seeing if you're on your toes already, okay? The clarifier of the meaning of the 30, okay, the book called The 30, this is going to be a, let's spell it together, La, La. Dengbu, Dengbu. Le, Le, Ka, Ka. Sa, Sa. Lek. Lek. So when you have in Jorlok a secondary suffix, you don't stop and do your accumulated part. You don't say la dembole ga lek sa lek. You don't say it that way. You you say them together. Say la, la. dengbu, dengbu. Le. le ka sa, sa. sa. Lek. lek. Okay. You know this word because you know the Heart Sutra where Lord Buddha says lek so lek so. Very well. It means well done. Siddha siddha. It means good. Okay. Like dashi de lek uh, means uh, you know. Have an auspicious day or something like that. It means high. Okay, it's like pow, pow, pa. Not b. It's not a b. It's not ba. It's pa. This part is vibrating. The voice box. Pa, pow, sha, ta, shit, shit, like shit. You know like shit nimbo by Tsong Kappa. Tongue like shit nimbo. What's like shit? Eloquence, well explained. Lekshe, lekpashepa, okay? Lekshe. So, uh, good explanation. Uh, good explanation. And then comes the, the short name of the book by which it would be known. Uh, say, La, La. Jatak, Jatak. Nja, Nja. Naro, Naro. Jo, jo. Na, Na. Jun. Okay? Jun, jun is the short for Junxing. Say Junxing. Junxing means uh, a tree that doesn't lose its leaves in the winter. What's that called? Evergreen? Evergreen. Uh, yeah. Okay, there's a debate about it. <laughs> Basically, Junxing is a Tibetan word for tree. The distinction between that and a tree which does lose its leaves is not so clear. Deciduous or something. Deciduous. It's not so clear division, so don't go translate it as evergreen. Uh, but it does mean a healthy, strong tree, Junxing. Oh, okay. Uh, and the most famous of all Junxings is the Paksam Junxing. Say Paksam Junxing. Uh, Sampa is related to Sam, which means your mind. So Sam means thought. And Pak means, uh, like Jepak Tema, means to estimate something uh, mentally. Paksam means whatever you want, whatever you can think of. Junxing means a tree. So this is similar to the idea of Aladdin's lamp. Uh, there's said to be a tree, a mythical tree, and you can go up and uh, say, I want a banana, and it will grow a banana. Or you can say, oh, no, I'd rather have an apple, and the banana will fall off, and an apple will grow. Or you can say, I want a bicycle for Christmas, and a bicycle will grow on the tree. And like that, it's uh, anything you want, it will grow on that tree. It's called a paksam jinshing, okay? A uh, magical tree that gives you any wish you want. So this is a reference to that. When he says tree, he's not just talking about any kind of tree. So, Paksam Junxing, Wishing Tree, Pa Agikui, Pe, Junbe. Then, as you know, Tao, uh, Pa, uh, I'm going to say Tao, Wa, Nga, Wang, Wang Po, Pa Naro Po, Wang Po. You know Wang, because you know it's a tantric initiation, it's called Wang. Which means what? Empowerment, power. Okay. So Wangbo, here when you put a bow on it, it means Lord. Okay. Wang by itself means power. When you add a bow on it, it means Lord or King, like that. So this is now the King of Wishing Trees. Okay. The King of the best Aladdin's lamp in the world. What? A book on how to, a book on Tibetan grammar. Because it, it will give you your highest wish, which is the ability to read the 200,000 Tibetan scriptures. So it's better than it. Teach me how to read 200,000 books. Okay, here it is. This is the best Aladdin's lamp you could ever have. This little poem about Tibetan grammar. Without it, you can't read those 200,000 books. Okay? So this is like a portal, a precious portal to the 200,000 extraordinary books of of Tibetan Buddhism. Unbelievable books. The greatest books ever written on this planet. Okay? Uh, Jumbe Wangbo, the, the king or the lord of wishing trees, is the short name 
of uh, his book, and oftentimes in Tibetan. Tibetans will refer to this work with these syllables. Okay, so say Lekshe Jenwang. Lekshe Jenwang. Most Tibetan books have a short name, like Larmim Chemo is an abbreviated name of the great book by Jetsun Kampa. And the, when you're referring to this book, you don't go up to say, somebody says, what are you studying? You don't say, Sum Chu Pei Dun Seo Che, Lek She Jun Pei Wombo. You say, I'm studying Lek She Jun Wong. You know, I'm studying, I'm studying Lek She Jun Wong. Say Lek She Jun Wong. Yeah, I'm studying Lek She Jun Wong. Then everybody knows you're talking about this grammar text. Uh, it was written uh, in the 19th century by a very, very, very famous Lama. And I want to teach you his name and then we'll We'll end this class and we'll start the next one. Okay? Uh, let's draw a look at this. Tao. Then Haiton. Tao Nga. Shapkyu. Ngu. La. Ngul. Ngul. It's closure of the throat. Nga. Nga. Ngu. Ngu. Ngul. Haiton. Ngul. Okay, Ngu means, you know, silver. It's the word for silver. It became the Tibetan word for money. Mu yagim be. Will you loan me some bucks, man? <laughs> okay. Mu means silver, but it means uh, money. Like in, 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 in India, it's rupee, right? Which comes from rupa, which means uh, silver. Okay. Mu uh, chu. Cha. Shapyu. Chu. What's that? Water. So. Silver water. Or. Quicksilver or mercury, okay? So this is the old word for mercury. It's an especially important word in Tibetan philosophy for the alchemists. Elixir is called muchu, the quicksilver that turns iron into gold, okay? Uh, so there's a place in Tibet, I don't know exactly where it is. There's an area like uh, New York or, you know, California called muchu. It's called quicksilver. The, the district is called quicksilver, okay? And so this Muchu means he came from Quicksilver, okay? He came from that area, Muchu. Then let's spell his name, Tao. Tao. Ya. Ya. Sai. Tao. Tao. Wa. Wa. Yatak. Yatak. Ya. Ya. Na. Na. Sa. Sa. Yang. Yang. Hai Tong. Yang. Okay? Yang. Why this changes, you know already, we went through it. Uh, na, Sa, Yang. Okay? Yang means, uh, do you know? Also? Uh, no, it means a melody or a harmony. For example, Saraswati's name in Tibetan is Yang Chenma. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was called Yang Chen. Okay, Yang Chen, which is a, a reference to Saraswati. Okay, because Saraswati is the goddess of the arts, including music and also grammar. Okay, the study of poetry and grammar, classical poetry. So he, he was given the name Yang Chen, okay? That's not his only name. This, probably name. this name probably came later in his life after he distinguished himself as a grammarian, okay? So his, real, his monk's name is Lo, Lo Song Chumpel, okay? And he was also a very famous uh, practitioner of the Vajrayogini secret teachings. And so you've heard his name. If you know that lineage and you've done those prayers, in your Lama Chippa practice, for example, uh, or your sadhana, you would see Losang Chimpel, uh, the name, that was his uh, monk's name. So, Yang Chen, uh, Se Ka, Ka. Ratak, Ta, Shapkyu, Tu, Pa, pa. Trup. Okay, Trup. Uh, we were talking about how this meant Artha, meaning. This means Siddha. So, uh, Dundruk means uh, Siddhartha, okay? So this means achieved, okay? Or like uh, spiritual achievements. Say Drupe. And then this is very famous, I think you know this one. Ra, Ra. Datak, Da, da. da. Naro, Naro, Do. do. So when Da, 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 Da has a head letter, it becomes a real English D. So you don't say Dorje, you say Dorje. Okay. Then Ra, Ra. Jatak, Jatak, Ja, ja. Dengbu, J. And then uh, anomaly, uh, an exception, 
we pronounce the head letter of the second syllable, which is an exception. Dorje. Say Dorje. Do means stone. J means king or lord like Jethum Kappa. So Dorje means a diamond, the king of all stones. So his name was Yang Chen Dupe Dorje. His monk's name was Losan Chimpil. And he came from Mu Chu. Uh, his teacher was uh, Mu Chu Dharma Bhadra. Say Mu Chu. Dharma, Dharma. Dharma. Padra. Padra. So he had a Sanskrit name. His teacher had a Sanskrit name. And he was a, himself a great grammarian and student of Sanskrit. Even his name was given Dharma Bhadra. You know, like Vira Bhadrasana, which is mispronounced in yoga studios as Vira Bhadrasana. I don't know why. Uh, that means, uh, Bhadra means pure or beautiful. And uh, so. Uh, his teacher's name is Beautiful Dharma, Dharma Bhadra. And his teacher also has the word uh, Yangchen attached to the beginning of his name because he was also, I'm sorry, Muchu, because he was also from the district of Muchu. So his teacher's name, full name, is Muchu Dharma Bhadra. Say Muchu, Muchu. Dharma, Dharma, Dharma Bhadra. 1772 to 1851. The student, 1809 to 1887. Uh, and he's recognized as one of the greatest uh, grammarians in Tibetan history. And uh, he wrote this versed summary of all of Tibetan grammar, which you are about to embark upon. Okay? And um, so they're sometimes called, the two of them, because they were two great grammarians and two great Vajogini practitioners, they're called Nguchu Yabse. Say Nguchu Yabse. Uh, Yab means like Yab Yum. It means uh, male of a pair, male-female pair. So it, in Tibetan, it means the father. It's honorific for the Holy Father. And then uh, se means the, the prince or princess, uh, meaning it's the honorific word for son or daughter, uh, high son or high daughter. So yabse often refers to a, a lama and their closest spiritual son or daughter are called yabse. Like uh, in the case of Jetsum Kappa, it's called Yapse Sum. Uh, the three, the father and his two spiritual sons, which are Ketub Jay and Gyalsub Gyalsub Jay and Ketub Jay. And then here you have Muchu Yapse. Uh, if you see the word Muchu Yapse, it means the spiritual father and son from Muchu, and it refers to uh, Yang Chen Dupe Dorje and his spiritual father, Muchu Dharmabhadra. Okay? All right, so we're about to embark on this text, and we'll do that in the next installment of this popular video series. Thank you.